We can't hear you. We can't hear you. There you go. Hello, everyone. Welcome hey. back to Data Talks for Paris Art Week. I am your host, Samuel Locher, and today I am joined by Mr. John Selberg. He is an author with an MFA uh, from the University of Missouri, and he is also a professor at Broward College here in sunny South Florida. So, how are you doing, John? I'm great. How are you doing? I'm great. Are you excited to talk about art education in the virtual world, the experience <laughs> of an artist and educator in 2020? Yeah, sounds great. Yeah. So I kind of want to start off with the same prompt um, we did with Dr. Conejo. Um, the new normal that we're living in now, social distancing, telecommuting, so much has moved in the digital space. Would you like to return to the old normal or, or what is, what is your stance on it? Uh, well, I think we are learning a lot from teaching virtually and everything that's going on. So I don't think we'll ever return, but I think that when we are back in person, certainly uh, I think we can take what we've learned and move forward. Um, exactly. Yeah, I think there's a lot of good come out of how we've adapted to this pandemic and it would be a real shame to to throw the baby out with the bathwater so to speak so yeah, from the pandemic, many professors taught classes online had you ever taught a class online prior to 2020 uh yeah i have um art history courses online but it's quite a bit different now teaching studio art online and actually shown. go ahead no, no, sorry, not to cut you off. That, that, that's what I would like to really get into into with you, though, because, you know, teaching a studio class online, I imagine, is very mm -hmm. difficult. It, it, it's, you know, I think it's a, a bit more possible to teach an art history survey, for sure, mm -hmm. online. But as far as something that's so like, tactile and intimate and in person and showing someone techniques on how to create yeah. artwork, how, how have you managed to do that online? Well, it, I, <laughs> I was nervous about it before the semester, but the school actually installed quite a few high definition cameras. So I'm able to uh, set up my artwork in my classroom um, and demonstrate, and then students can show what they're working on, send me images, so I can work from multiple different camera angles. And that's actually provided the ability for students to see closer than uh, when they're hovering around me and I'm demonstrating. Um, so that's actually worked really well with that. And um, I think the most important part of art education is building confidence in students. And that uh, is usually done through building a community. And I think that was my biggest anxiety entering this semester. How do you build community virtually with students? Usually when we're in class, in the classroom, uh, you know, I can have like the lights going, we have graffiti all over the walls, students get to naturally talk to each other. So how could they do this over Zoom with most of their cameras turned off? Mm. But uh, surprisingly, um, I feel like almost a stronger community has been built. Uh, the students have talked about since they have the choice to turn on the cameras or not, they don't feel judged by their physical appearance. 
and uh, they've created a lot of group chats amongst each other. Uh, we've started a really strong art club um, with all of this going on, and they've opened up in ways that they haven't before because they're in their comfortable places. They're at home. Um, some students are uh, taking a class live from Colombia. Two of them are. Um, one student's taking a class live from Mexico, and then in different spots in Florida, not just in Broward. Yeah. So it's actually turning out to be uh, going far better than I expected. That is really cool. So you're actually going to the campus mm -hmm. to where you, you would have taught prior to the pandemic, and you've yeah. got the class from there. Yeah, yeah. Which is strange because usually I have a bunch of students hanging out in and outside of the classroom, and uh, yeah, now it's just empty. Uh, it's just security and uh, just me there. You know, there's no students around. I do have to say, in researching our discussion, you have one of the best rate my professor scores I've ever seen. So oh, really? <laughs> giving you anything besides a five out of five? Oh, uh, I'll have to check it out. I haven't looked at that in a long time. <laughs> You have good reviews, you gotta check it out. <laughs> oh, That's um, good um, so how has 2020 shift to the digital space disrupted your plans for the year outside of teaching? And what have you done to adapt? Oh, uh, it's been difficult in the sense that uh, most of my family lives about 24 hours from here and I haven't been able to travel to go see them. Um, just because of the risk of traveling. Uh, so my wife and my child and I have just uh, been here since February. And so uh, at first with all the unknowns, that was very difficult. You know, we we're, we're lucky to have a yard and gardens and um, lots of bananas and lots of vegetables growing. But uh, yeah, we had, we had plans to travel all summer. You know, it's one of the nice things about teaching is you can take summer just to travel wherever you want. And we had to stay put this year. So uh, it was, it definitely took some adaption to get used to, but uh, I think I was better off than a lot of people with it. Yeah. Where are you from originally? Uh, I'm from Peoria, Illinois, originally. Oh, very cool. Yeah. Little river town south of Chicago. Yep. I, yeah, most, I'm in the same boat. I don't have any family here in South Florida. Most of my family, my, my closest relatives are in Tampa. I was just, oh, okay. my parents, my younger siblings, they all sit thousand miles away in New York. Yeah. yeah. Have you been able to go see them? You know something? I have my parents actually currently live in Tennessee and they're so remote <laughs> that they're uh, there's not really too much of a risk of traveling there. Um, That's great. I, I actually did I went up in the summer and I spent a whole week with them. I was I was getting I, I had this Bit of anxiety at the beginning of the pandemic like oh my god am i ever gonna see my relatives again and fortunately I don't, I don't know if it's because so many people in my family work in healthcare, but yeah. like 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 my, my sister isn't that scared of me bringing covid to her because she works on the covid unit in her hospital every oh, okay. you know what i mean so yeah. for me <laughs> to go yeah. see her um but you know like i early on in the pandemic i went out to tampa i have two young nieces i helped them with their online school because, you know, honestly, we're talking about online education for college students right now. I think one of the really, uh, like, the, the most problematic thing about the shift to online school is for younger students, kids that are, you know, third grade, second grade, first grade, kindergarten. Yeah. Um, we, we expect this amount of technological literacy out of children that really their parents don't even have a lot of the times. Right. Oh my gosh, especially when uh, they had to do this kind of abrupt transition in the middle of the semester at the onset of the pandemic. I mean, all of a sudden you have like, my niece is eight years old and all of a sudden she has to figure out how to basically teach herself everything the teacher was teaching her on the yeah. internet, something that she wasn't even doing before. So I, it just makes me sad for, you know, all the, the young people that don't have uncle like me to go you know yeah them. because also like my sister wasn't working from home my sister works in healthcare she was out on the front lines working 10 12 hour shifts every oh my day. gosh yeah trying to you know prevent the spread of covid so yeah, yeah it, it's a it's a little disheartening i mean i i did help them um 
a transition at the, be- the beginning of the school year this year um, and figure out how their classes work. Things are a lot more streamlined now that they have like a summer to figure it out, I guess. But yeah. um, how did that work for you? Were, were you in the middle of uh, teaching? Um, yeah, it was It was the middle of a semester. And um, luckily, my son is just one year old, so he's not in school yet. Um, but a lot of my friends, uh, the same thing. Like, they had to learn. It's very different teaching college than teaching K through 12, you know, like they go to school to learn how to teach, you know, as professors, we don't, um, we go to school for what we do. And, um, you know, something that's been very difficult for, uh, people to figure out how to teach things, uh, that, uh, kids would learn in school. And I think it's given them a lot more respect for what K through 12 teachers do. Um, and yeah, even for college, it was very abrupt. Um, all of a sudden, uh, we got wind that we had about a week, and we didn't know if we were going to come back on campus. Uh, so it was it was a bit of a rough transition, but the students pulled through. Um, and uh, you know, a lot of students we had to definitely cut a lot of slack for because a lot of people were losing their jobs, their families were losing their jobs. So you know, we did everything that we could for them and didn't try to stress them too hard with academics. You know, make sure that we gave them the information if they were able to still absorb it during that time. Yeah, that's, that's one thing that's really, really broken my heart about the, the pandemic um, is here in Florida, in mean, South Florida especially, we don't really have, um, aside from oranges, you know, and we don't have orange plantations in Miami-Dade County, well, maybe in Homestead, I know, but um, we sell sunshine. Tourism is the absolute backbone of this economy. And, you know, we have lots of people here that work in finance, that work in, uh, you know, import export, like from Port of Miami and warehousing and things like that. But really, the backbone of everything here, some of the biggest companies that are headquartered in South Florida, have to do with tourism. Whether you're yeah. talking about, you know, Mountain Blue on Miami Beach, or you're talking about Carnival Cruise Lines, or you're talking yeah. about a small like boutique hostel. No, yeah, there aren't, there aren't tourists anymore. And yeah. it's tourists. I mean, it's just where is the money coming from our economy? I mean, you know, I, there was a really highly publicized layoff. That had been happening in South Florida for months prior to Disney laying off all those people. You know, there was yeah. some, of, um, some of the boutique hotel chains here in South Beach. Um, they laid off hundreds, if not thousands. Of oh, people. man. Very early on in the onset. I don't know if you've, yeah. ever, if you've been to Ocean Drive lately, but they have um, they have completely cut off Ocean Drive to uh, car traffic, which is actually nice. I hope they keep that even you know post pandemic. Yeah. Um, is that is that down in Miami where they have that cut off? Miami Beach in Miami Beach. Oh, okay, on the ocean in Miami Beach, like the main forest drag that's normally normally it's so busy, like you can barely yeah. walk on the sidewalk. And now, I mean, now, it, I honestly, I think it's kind of nice, <laughs> like, for the <laughs> locals to enjoy, because now you go there, and it's, like, kind of, like, locals, like, rollerblading, everyone's, you know, socially distant. But there's no, there's no tourists. The hotels are empty. I drive past some of these high-rise hotels in Miami at night. There's not a light on. Yeah. On, they're empty. And it, it makes me very nervous. For I, I think it's, it's very important that we band together as a, a local community here in South Florida during this time to really, you know, keep continually like reinvesting in our communities. Like I said, we don't have these outside dollars coming in right now. Yeah. It's tough. And and we don't know when or as it will be at the capacity that it was pre pandemic. So yeah. it's, I, I've gone to um up, up in Hollywood actually, or no Hallandale but near Hollywood. Um, I, I, I volunteer sometimes at the, uh, at the Feeding South Florida uh, food bank there. And there was such a giant spike in the amount of families across the Tri-County area here in South Florida that were getting food assistance from uh, Feeding South Florida. I, last time I was there, um, or last time they told me the numbers, it was, I think, in August. They were helping 1.6 million families. Oh, my gosh. Families across the, the, the Craig County area, right? So wow. That's people, that's family. That's a mom and a dad and a kid. Yeah. 
can stand Lord, I don't really get people too far. If you lose your job, yeah, we got that twelve hundred dollars stimulus check. If you were lucky, you know, I don't even know how many months ago now. So it, it's not yeah, but in, around here that barely pays a month's rent. Exactly, you know, that doesn't pay the month's rent for a, a studio apartment. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. So that being said, you know, these are kind of sad times we're living through you know it, it's nice to try and find the silver lining what's going on how has the uh the pandemic uh affected your artwork or in your inspiration to create i i think positively uh it's provided me with a little bit more time um and a little bit more time to think because i'm not constantly on the go without being able to travel like that time that we'd be traveling i've been able to you know sit down in the evenings and really make art and explore new methods and uh really really crank out a new series um so yeah i think it's, it's been positive in that aspect and just you know like when we're making art we're uh we're, we're taken from all the things that are going on in the world and in our lives, everything that we're being influenced by. And these are such charged times that, I mean, they're, they're hugely influential, whether we're speaking directly about the times or not, it's still affecting each and every one of us significantly. Yeah. Um, so, and I think that that's been, uh, that's definitely been a drive uh, for my art lately. Definitely. Yeah. What, what has been inspiring you to uh, lately? Like what has, um, I, I, I took a look at some of your artwork and it seems you're, you're very inspired by you know, flora and fauna, especially, you know, like the kinds we see around here mm-hmm. in South Florida. Is that mm-hmm. easy? Or is there, what, 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 what has been? Uh, <laughs> well, I'm somebody who, <laughs> before I moved to Florida, I would hike easily six hours a day, like yeah. go once, twice, three times a day, often, and every single day I'd, I'd hike out at night without a flashlight. But in South Florida, there's dinosaurs everywhere. I mean, you got sharks in the water and crocs and like all over the place. So you have to be super careful. So, um, you know, like in, in my yard, you know, I've started growing things since I haven't been able to hike as much. Um, just learning about what plants grow here well, what plants don't. And it's brought in a lot of um, butterflies and different reptiles. Uh, so, I mean, we'll walk outside sometimes and I'll be carrying my son uh, to watch the sunrise and we'll see a giant iguana on the fence, right? right. Things like that. And it's it's just amazing to see just the detail, you know, because I'm from a place where you mostly see mammals. Right. And so just seeing uh, the complexity of the reptiles. And then we have uh, parrots that fly through in the I, land on the... Oh my gosh, I have giant flocks of parrots that live yeah. inside my apartment. I love... They're so noisy, though. Oh, I love it. Yeah. You know, when they're coming, I'll run outside and go check them out. <laughs> Big wave of these green birds flying by. Love it. Yeah. Where do you hike here in South Florida? Um, I'm a big fan of, I mean, there's nowhere to hike the way that I want to hike, but uh, there's a park called John Lloyd State Park, which is like a beach park. Yeah. And they have some back trails that um, you can kind of get away. Um, yeah. It's by the airport, so it's noisy, but uh, it's it's peaceful. Um, you can definitely like meditate with your walk there. Um, that's the main spot that I go to here. I remember I was asking one of my friends here around the time I first moved to South Florida, where, where's a hiking trail? Where you know, where's where can you get out in nature here? And I think they they said it was something like Shark Bite Trail. They told me about. I'm like, this does not sound appealing. Yeah. And that this is my favorite thing to explain to because like you, I'm not originally from not only South Florida, I'm not from Florida, period. I'm, I'm from the North yeah. where we just have like squirrels and like <laughs> deer maybe. Um, yeah. And I love explaining to my friends from elsewhere and my, my colleagues from elsewhere that we kind of live in like a real life Pokemon type situation. Yeah. <laughs> like we, have, we have feral peacocks, we have feral roosters, we have iguanas, we have alligators, we have crocodiles, we have, the snakes are my favorite. Do you know about yeah. the snakes in the Everglades? It is good. Yeah, boas. For, for everyone who is not from Florida or even if you're from Florida watching this and you just don't know, I need to break down the situation for you. So irresponsible pet owners in South Florida will go to, you know, the pet shop, the exotic pet store, they'll buy a snake, like a boa constrictor or an anaconda. 
and they'll keep it for a while and then maybe the snake bites little jimmy or something and they don't want to keep the snake anymore so they just release it into the wild because that's where it belongs <laughs> right um we have this giant thing right next to it we're a very densely uh, populated area here in south florida because we're wedged in between the atlantic ocean and the everglades so these snakes find their way into the everglades and what ends up happening is you have one i don't know my snake but from what i understand you have a snake like a boa constrictor that can grow to untold lengths and another snake like i don't know an example of like some kind of like poisonous snake right so you have that but a poisonous snake usually cannot grow to untold lengths like a boa constrictor can mm-hmm. but they end up finding each other in the everglades the snake that can grow to untold lengths and the highly venomous snake and they have little demon babies and they create <laughs> hybrid monster snakes that hunters and you know preservationists in the everglades find that have like swallowed whole alligators these are like there's so many crazy pictures you can find of snakes that have like eaten like deer and like alligators out here in florida and the state of florida actually sponsors a snake hunt every year where they hire these professionals from india they come in with mongoose and then they also get some of our you know like real salt of the earth floridians to go that we have to, pay to go in with them and they go on a massive snake hunt and this is really this is all we can do at this point to try and prevent like the absolute like destruction of the natural ecology of the everglades is we have this insane snake hunt it's actually on my bucket list to go on the snake hunt one day <laughs> I, really, I need like a sensei to teach me how to like hunt gators and like navigate the everglades but th- this is on my, my life's bucket list before i end my time in south florida yeah <laughs> i don't know yeah. the everglades Oh yeah, um, when we first moved here right away, the trail that you're talking about, uh, I think it was like Shark Valley, you know, it's this 14 mile loop and my wife and I looked it up because we were going to take our bikes out there and uh, they were like, yeah, nobody's been uh, attacked by an alligator since 1989 out there. So we're like, all right, that's good odds. <laughs> so we take our bikes out there and it's beautiful. Uh, you go out on this trail and you see all sorts of species of birds that look like they're prehistoric yeah. but we started counting the alligators that we'd see right alongside the trail or ran across this trail and some of these are massive okay. and when we got halfway to mile seven we stopped counting at the hundredth alligator that we saw and they're just all over the place just right by the side see i can't like i need to work up like the gumption <laughs> to do that because I, like this is why I need a sensei because I could never like I would never ever, like I I remember the first time I saw a wild alligator it was an urban alligator it was not it was not in the Everglades it was oh my god it was in Doral Florida like right outside the Dalton Mall which is like one of the biggest malls we have here in South Florida I it was just it was a drizzly day like we have so often here in South Florida and I'm going up the ramp to get on the Dolphin Expressway. It's just a giant highway. I'm, I'm in the middle of the city, people, if you don't understand this, you know. I'm in the middle of the city going up the ramp to get on the highway. A six-foot dinosaur just on the side of the road. Giant alligator, the biggest alligator I'd ever seen. And I was telling my friends, oh my gosh, it was so cool. I wanted to stop my car and take a picture, like get out and take a picture on the side of the road. And they're like, you cannot do that. The gator will come. And then they were showing me, like some of my friends that grew up in Florida, they were showing me these educational videos. I guess they show kids that grow up in Florida the proper way to run away from an alligator. <laughs> Zigzags. <laughs> <laughs> have, you ever seen, have you ever seen them run? No, I haven't. They run really fast. They can run, like, I would think that they couldn't, but those little stubby legs, they get up and they go. Yeah, yeah. Alleg- Crazy. Like, like I guess they can even climb fences, so even if you're uh, by the intercoastal and have a fence, they can climb right over it. <laughs> and that's why it's like you see all these subdivisions here in Florida are just, um, you know, land that's been like reclaimed. And so they have these like ponds in the middle of all the houses. Never lived there. Those are begging for an alligator to come in there. Yeah. yeah. And it's like, even if, you know, say you have a pet dog. The gator, mm-hmm. the dog. you know, the gator mm-hmm. probably won't get you, but the gator can get your dog. Yeah, 
Yeah. So you're not careful. It's really, it, yeah. So I think we're um, we're getting close to the end of our time here. Um, is there anything you'd like to leave the artist with before we go? Or leave uh, everyone in Paris with and around the world watching? <laughs> Uh, just keep making art. It's important. Express yourself. Always express yourself freely. That's one of the most important things you can do. And, you know, be influenced by yourself, not everybody else. You know, do what you believe in. Absolutely. And where can everyone find you online? Uh, I have Instagram at Jay Selberg and a website www.johnselberg.com. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us. It was a real pleasure speaking with you, Don. Um, take care, everyone. Thanks for joining us. All right.